Shalom, everyone. Boker Tov. Boker Tov, everyone that's uh, at home or other places on YouTube. Great to see friends here. Reverend Tom Harris, fantastic. And Tom, fantastic. Shalom, everybody. Um, we are in for such a special treat. This has only taken maybe, I don't know, 15 years to happen. <laughs> um, I have Abdullah's bio, and I was thinking about reading it through because he has so many incredible, uh, Imam and Tepe, I should say, incredible honors. And, you know, it means a lot to invite someone over from the Duke University over here to obtain, you know, a college park guy like myself, a Maryland guy. Um, but here's what I want to say about Imam and Tepe. You know, there is that Jewish tradition that there are 36 righteous people in the world walking around, <laughs> Lamed Bavniks. You don't necessarily know who they are, but they sustain the world. I know, I say this with, I, I don't want to embarrass the Imam, but uh, truly, Imam Antepoli is someone so exceptional, so special, so incredible in wisdom, in uh, both the wisdom of the intellect, but with the wisdom of the heart. Um, Imam Tepli has been someone who not only leads a community and proud in his practice and a proud Muslim American, um, but is someone who's willing to both give love and support to other communities, but also to lovingly critique and give leadership and prophetic voice in his own community. And as, as a rabbi, as rabbis, it's sometimes, you know, the hardest thing to do is not necessarily speak out to the world, it's also to speak out into your own people. It takes a tremendous amount of courage. Um, Imam Antepli has led in numerous ways at Duke University. Uh, he now teaches at the Sanford School of Public Policy um, and serves as a chaplain over it at, at Duke really developed the Muslim community over there, but also really is an international leader in Jewish Muslim relations with the Shalom Hartman Institute, which many of you know through various studies we've done and all kinds of things, including the fact that Jenny and I have studied there over the years, and I'm a, a Hartman fellow. Um, I mean, really, Imam Antepli is considered you know, the, the, the highest echelon. Uh, of, of the Harmony students says a lot. We have been wanting to have Imam Tepli over here for many, many years. He has spoken throughout all over the world. Uh, it obviously has been in Israel numerous times uh, and Palestinian territories and various places. Um, I, it's unfortunate to get so long to bring him over just a half hour away over to Raleigh, um, but we are truly in for a treat. The work that he has done, the holy work he has done to truly communicate to the Jewish community and other communities about uh, the, about Muslims in general, Islam, uh, to deal with issues of anti-Semitism within the Muslim community, but also around Islamophobia in the Jewish community and, and other communities. It's just been so exceptional. Um, Imam Antepli really in some ways, you know, he stands alone. I mean, he's not alone because we support him and love him so much, but he stands on the pinnacle of tremendous work and risk and courage and my admiration for him, just, it shows no bounds. I am so, so grateful that you are here today. Thank you. Thank you it means much. the world, and we are truly blessed to have a round of applause. Thank you. 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 I need to go to perform a but I'll read it for a minute to see introductions. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, my brother, Eric, Rabbi Solomon, for this wonderful, heartwarming introduction. Yes, it was a mystery why I travel around and engage with the Jewish community, so sort of Sydney to New Zealand, to Jerusalem to New York, and not come to Rome. So I'm glad we are correcting that mistake, and I'm sure this is just the beginning of many, many conversations to come. And I also have to tell you about my community. I go around and see these synagogues. Many parts of the world, people are struggling to find one Mensch rabbi. How did you get two? <laughs> How did you guys get two of them at, this, at the same time? This is an incredible honor and opportunity uh, and a blessing that we need to, we need to be grateful for. Um, I'm going to get rid of this. Can you all hear me well? Yeah, yes. My voice is not the best. I'm not sick. I did home rapid test this morning, PCR the day before to make sure I'm healthy. It's just I talk too much, <laughs> according to my children. People see my children and say, oh, we heard your father speak here and there. And they say, yeah, he talked a lot. <laughs> and my voice is not in the best uh, situation. I would like to talk briefly about the Jewish-Muslim reconciliation and why for Jews and Muslims all around the world, but especially in the United States, this needs to be at the utmost communal, ethical, and moral priority. And our priorities are, should be backed by, by not only our finances, but our commitments, our moral imperatives as well. And it is a sense of frustration why this hasn't taken the level of um, urgency 
and importance in our community despite increasingly mounting evidence that there are potential nightmares as the Jewish Muslim relationships are deteriorating globally, including the United States. And not only just running away from the nightmares and the problems and the potential consequences if we neglect Jewish Muslim relations, what we might be facing, what are some of the opportunities, what are some of the potential sources of joint celebration partnerships that we are missing. And this, unfortunately, I'm starting with a very uh, bitter note, but that's the case that unfortunately, most people are open to improving Jewish Muslim relations. No one is in principle against it, but their commitments do not back this. It, has, it hasn't risen to the priority list, which I hope my modest and broken voice remarks will, will push the agenda and see if here in the United States, here in North Carolina, here in the Triangle area, if we can do better in one way or another. The Jewish Christian reconciliation after the Holocaust, even though it happened because of Holocaust, and even though most people are now taking this Jewish Christian reconciliation somewhat for granted, and even though um, uh, it is experiencing incredible setbacks as the antisemitism is on the rise, much of the healthy healing of Jewish Christian relations or taming the Christian antisemitism, the amount of uh, pressure, healthy pressure that we are putting on this ancient Western Christian antisemitism is showing its ugly face, increasing in many places. Despite all of this, despite all of this, it is still an incredible miracle. It is, it wasn't, it wasn't predictable that it could happen in such a way that after Holocaust, Jews, especially at least in the West, will um, not only survive, but uh, find an opportunity to thrive in the Jewish Christian relationship and millennium long uh, uh, Christian hate against Judaism and Jews would be tamed and controlled and kept in an under, under uh, tight leash. This is no, no, no less than a miracle. Um, if I, as part of my work, I take Holocaust deniers, and Holocaust clarifiers, mostly Muslims and clergy from the United States and from other parts of the world. For the last 20 years, I take them to Holocaust sites. Uh, we go to Auschwitz, we go to Birkenau, we go to Dachau. So I am keenly aware of what kind of a devastating, one of the darkest chapters of the human history, Holocaust was. And it is unlike any other tragedy. I don't know if you have ever seen some of my writings, why Holocaust is different from uh, other genocides, other atrocities, unfortunately, we have a long list of them in so many ways, uh, but also two main ways. One, it wasn't just in the heat of the war, soldiers uh, doing atrocities and things like that. It wasn't, it wasn't a war crime. It was something that, I, as I said, for it took 2,000 years to come and arrive. It was so, and uh, quote unquote, geniusly thought through. There was a decades long preparation. Uh, and, and therefore, it was incredibly successful. For six years, when you go to Burkina or Auschwitz, they show you, I don't know if you've ever been, they became so quote unquote successful. German engineering minds were put into this for decades that they were able to turn every single person come out of trains into ashes less than three hours. They were able to shave them, gas them, and turn them into ashes, which is incredibly mind boggling. So many people think Holocaust was in the, in, the, in the heat of the war, German soldiers were committing atrocities and et cetera, which wasn't the case at all. And the second is scale and the death of destruction. Uh, one third of the Jewish world is destroyed. And not only human beings was destroyed. I don't have to teach you Holocaust, this is part of your history, but it is still shocking. It sends chills to my, to my, to my core that one third of the global Jewry is not only just human beings, but millenniums long accumulated wisdom, culture, Polish, Eastern European, Jewish heritage is completely destroyed. And I do the math when I first went there. Imagine one third of the Muslims destroyed in six years. And not only Muslims, that means like 600 million. All the universities of Istanbul, Cairo, all the accumulated culture, heritage is, is completely wiped out. In 1939, there were three and a half million Jews living in Poland. In 1945, only 100,000 left. 
and today maybe a thousand are living, etc. What an incredible scale of death and destruction. What an incredible. And if anybody pays attention to the scale and the uniqueness of Holocaust, could have never imagined how long we came along, how much we, we were able to we were able to come along and look at the Jewish community in the West, in Europe, and the United States and North America. And uh, there is some so much to be celebrated, as we say, Baruch Hashem. Uh, we have to celebrate and we have to preserve this achievement, this reconciliation, and find out a way that hate doesn't go away. In a holy sanctuary, I hate to use those names, but it is like a like herpes, it will never go away. You have to constantly be diligent and hardworking and put the pressure on this. And we are seeing if we relax how these old habits and old hate resurrect itself. But there is something to be celebrated and lifted. This is what I would like to put as a model into Jewish Muslim reconciliation. So for the 21st century, a similar reconciliation is required between Jews and Muslims. Despite our incredibly similar religious frame of record, despite there is no any other religion in terms of theology, in terms of scripture, in terms of tradition, in terms of law, in terms of understanding God in, in doing, not only just believing, taking God's love and obedience and, and manifesting itself in every aspect of your life, from your food to from your prayer to from your business to relationship. To, don't get me wrong, I am not, I am not uh, sugarcoating the differences between Judaism and Islam. But if you read and understand on the theological and normative legal sense, there is no religion similar than Judaism and Islam. Our sense of monotheism, our understanding of world, our understanding of ethical moral frame of references, it is incredibly coming from the same place, speaking the same language. When I go to Jerusalem, yes, which I go at least three, four times a year before the, before the, um, before the pandemic. You know, I don't know if that was a life before pandemic, so I'm trying to get a sense of my, my time. Uh, I always go to these traditional madrasa, yeshiva, uh, problematic communities. But when I go and sit in the Beit Midrash, where people are studying text, trying to engage with text, it's like my madrasa, my, my place. Uh, it is so similar. They are speaking the same language of Hashem, God, and engaging with it in the same tune, etc. Despite these incredible similarities, why we understand, how we understand religion and God, humanity, ethics, and morality. And despite, despite incredible, uh, the better and different historical experience with one another, Jewish-Muslim relations, it wasn't as rosy as some Muslim apologists claim. It wasn't egalitarian. It wasn't 21st century social democrat place where Jews and Muslims, were. it was hierarchical. Muslims were on the first class, Jews and Christians were ranked according to their communal value. But if you compare Jewish experience in Europe and Jewish experience in the, in the Muslim majority world, it is not even comparable. In its own time, it was one of the most successful coexistence story you could ever imagine. If you ever go to, hopefully, Istanbul in better days, you must go to a um, 500-year museum where the Sephardic community, when the peace loving Catholics killed them and kicked them out of Spain, they all came to Ottoman lands. And in that museum, there is a small museum, but it does an incredibly good job in summarizing what was the Jewish experience in the 11th through 18th, 19th century in the Muslim majority world, in the Balkans, in Anatolia, in the Middle East, in North Africa, uh, wherever they were, and they have letters, they have memoirs. They are trying to be brethren, Jewish communities in France, in Germany, in Poland, in a way seeing that they will never accept you. You will never, they, they saw the story is like Holocaust or regular program. You have to come back, you have to come to this, this part of the world where we are not equal citizens, but we are living uh, with a religious autonomy, et cetera. So these two religious similarity and relatively better historical experience with one another, Despite this incredible potential, we are not doing well. We are not doing well. And the Jewish Muslim relations is a collusion force. 
getting uh, worse almost daily in every aspect of the Jewish Muslim world. Uh, and this Muslim anti Semitism is on the rise uh, on every part of the world, including the United States as well. Uh, I know this because, in all honesty, I was the victim of that Muslim anti Semitism. I grew up in an environment that secular, not religious, very secular, ultra nationalist upbringing of my own. My home, my school, early on, as I was becoming a teenager, trying to understand the world, trying to make sense of the world, why after many years of golden civilization, Muslims are failing, Turks are failing, why we are economically, socially, politically in a perpetual losing state, I was given a very sophisticated anti-Semitic propaganda that all Muslim misery is because of this cancerous evil community, because of this cancerous evil religion called Judaism, and the Jews, they are behind the banks, they are behind the media, they are behind everything, and they are here to destroy the Islam and Muslim community. Many people don't appreciate, quote unquote, they or they underestimate how seductive hate is, how much it plays a role in giving such a convincing, cheap black and white answers to complicated questions. That's why many people find comfort in hate, because then they don't have to think, they don't have to understand the nuances. They can collectively dehumanize the problem and say, all my miseries, 1.7 billion of us Muslims failing over and over again on a daily basis because of this one particular problem or one particular community. The first book I read about Jews and Judaism at the age of 12 was the children's version of the Protocols of Elders of Zion, the children's version. And the second book I read in Turkish, mind you, uh, was the Henry Ford International Jew, the second one, the famous American anti-Semite. Uh, God is a God of irony because the Nazi Ford Foundation, um, almost half of its board is Jewish and, and lost five CEOs, Ford is Jewish. I really hope his bones are spinning in his brain. <laughs> that God, God is the best revenge taker. And, and some of my work with the Holocaust denying Muslims uh, they were paid by the Ford Foundation. So it's, I cannot tell you when I was eating doner kebab with these Muslims in Germany with the four dollars, uh, I am just sending cosmic messages to Henry Ford. <laughs> you poisoned my heart, but God turned them into blessings. Now with your money, with your descendants' money, we are doing something I hope give you more pain in your brain. And the third book I read was my three times before the age of 50. It's not a, just a bias or anything like that. I was made to believe for a number of years, Jews as people and Judaism as a religion is irredeemable evil, cancerous. And they, are, they need to be, in, in a way, most people actually, if you listen to them, they are not denying the world. They are glorifying it. They are not saying it didn't happen. They are saying, I'm glad it happened. And I hope somebody will finish the job. I hope somebody will, will, uh, will complete this final solution. They see that Hitler saw something it's sick, evilest thing you could ever imagine, but it's, it's on the rise, unfortunately. These kind of literature, <coughs> I apologize, I'm not going to speak too much as my voice is deteriorated significant. I hope you will engage in the QA as well. I know how bad it is, and my experience is not alone. Thank God, Baruch Hashem, God of mercy, didn't allow me to live with that kind of poison. Thank God, my religion saved me. I became religious. I converted to Islam. And understanding Islam, studying religion, studying the main ethical moral teachings of my own text. I don't know how you guys do it. <laughs> it never works, unless it's a bar. I need something like yours to, to, be, able to, to be able to make it, make it work. <clears throat> so studying Islam through its own main theology, main all ethical moral framework, and studying my text, studying what Quran says about Jews and Judaism. I couldn't reconcile the hate that I was swallowed before and while I was learning about and not studying my religion. And it slowed me significantly and studying history. I found out that Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, married to two Jewish women. One of them converted to Islam on the day of the marriage. Other one did She remained as Jewish. She died as Jewish. Muhammad attended Shabbat services. He had Jewish in-law. He ate kosher food. This is like a slap to my oceans of hate that I have 
I have swallowed over the years. Hmm. With your permission, I'm going to hold yeah. it. <laughs> Next time, I'll bring my own Bukhara and keep it. So hopefully, you don't have to listen to my big skull. <laughs> and, and I took the nearest exit driving in the opposite direction after spending years in pro Palestinian activism, burning Israeli flags, processing my own anti Semitism. <clears throat> but God gave me an opportunity to work and critique Muslim anti Semitism in many platforms, especially moving to the United States, working with various organizations, Muslim and otherwise. I see the problem is emerging and it's going really, really deep in the wrong direction in the, in the fastest way possible. That what I experienced in early 1980s, it is manifesting. And as the Palestinian, Israeli Palestinian situation is uh, deteriorating, as Palestinian suffering is deepening, as, as the Muslim perception of what's going on there is making my Muslim community members more vulnerable towards anti Semitism, confirming the anti Semitism, the problem, is, the problem is growing in many folds, including the United States as well. So despite Despite this uh, brief visit to the value of focus, despite this very grim situation that I can give many more examples of why Jewish Muslim relations is at its worst time, historically speaking, and with any indication, including the United States, it's going in the, in the opposite uh, direction. I can give a few examples in the United States as well. Uh, many of the Muslim communities, because of their Understandable and to a certain extent admirable solidarity with Palestinians. They are swallowing incredible amount of irresponsible information about what's going on in the Middle East. And many bad faith actors whose job is to spread this anti Semitic interest in the Muslim community is getting increasing success in corrupting the hearts and minds of American Muslims vis a vis-a-vis vis -vis Israel, Judaism, Zionism. They simply do not understand the nuances, what is the, what is the criticizing the state of Israel's policies towards Palestinians? And what is the line where you cross into hate? And when you start trafficking in the, in the quote unquote good old anti-Semitism, reading pages out of the protocols of the other side. Many of my community, unfortunately, do not know the difference. They don't have the education. And they regretfully, increasingly, they have their own Jewish validators that are, there are marginal renegades, uh, Jewish groups, who are more than happy to uh, show up in Muslim spaces and validate what they think of. Uh, and they may be minuscule, they may be unheard of in the Jewish communities, they may represent 0.1% of the Jewish community, but in the Muslim space, in the Muslim mirror, they create, they, they, they appear like a giant. Uh, groups like Natura Karta, I don't know if, you, if people know them here, the anti-Zionist Jews who are more than happy to more than happy to uh, validate, as I, as I call them, to ex existing voices. And then increasingly, some of the far left the Jewish groups who take their political opposition to Zionism and Israel into such irresponsible levels that many Muslim and Muslim anti-Semites are using them as an evidence to their own anti-Semitism as well. I don't, I don't mean to take, drag us too quick into the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but we have to talk about it. We really have to talk about this, and maybe that's my good segue to what can be done. There are two types of Jewish Muslim relations happening in the United States, and both of them, at best, are ineffective. At best, if not, it is, it is part of the problem. There are two ways American Jews and American Muslims are engaging with one another so far, which I hope this engagement will not be one of them. The first engagement. I am trying to use the most respectful language to make sure I'm not trivializing or disrespecting good people's work as well. But one of the most common Jewish Muslim encounters and experiences here is well-meaning Jews and Muslims. They come together and they talk about anything and everything but elephants in the room. They talk about Abraham, Hagar, they talk about kosher chicken, halal chicken, hummus, <laughs> but what brings us together, our common ancestors, Abraham, it's all fuzzy and fine. And, but the moment they, they try to point out, uh, and they don't even have a choice when, whenever there's a cycle of violence. Like I see this uh, Al Jazeera journalist killing. We still do not know who killed and what, etc. 
but it's, it's most people have already made up their mind before the bullet left the gun already. And people go back to the similar. I see this waves of hate, prejudice, anger, frustration, wiping out the well-meaning cafe conversation. It's falling apart. It's not, it doesn't, this fluffy kubaya singing sessions is not developing into a level of health and strength where we can, as American Jews and American Muslims, where we can talk about these difficult issues related to Israeli Palestinian conflict. The second type of conversation, which is even to me more problematic, is we arrive to a conversation to talk about Israeli Palestinian conflict with no interest or curiosity about the other people's point of view. We have our self serving facts. We have our self serving. Everybody has their own favorite uh, UN resolution. I have 17 of them. They have 29 of them. Everybody's throwing facts to one another. And nobody is really engaging with each other. Nobody is trying to understand the other points. We are debating politics in, in the most harmful and destructive way with almost no point of uh, any potential reconciliation, et cetera. These two are very harmful, at best, at best a waste of time, at worst an ongoing giving an opportunity to marginal and Islamic and hateful groups in the Muslim community and marginal and Islamophobic Muslim hating Jewish groups in the Jewish community, incredible, incredible outsized power for them to dehumanize Islam and Muslims. Many Muslims, without even actually meeting one Jew, they already make up their mind that these people are worshiping the state of Israel, they are racist, they hate Palestinians, they kill and displace Palestinians for pleasure. And similarly, increasing number of Jews are making their mind about Islam that it's just a violent religion. They are not civilized, they are not this and they are not that, etc. So what we need to do is to, you may not start from the elephants in the room. You may not start with Israeli Palestinian conflict. But from the very beginning, if you don't design any Jewish Muslim relations and conversation where we can engage directly what divides us in the first place, how can we tap into the common moral teachings that we share? How can we tap into our relatively better history? And how can we, more importantly, tap into America? How we can tap into our American citizenship identity as two minority faith communities instead of trying to undermine each other? instead of playing the zero-sum game against one another. How we can connect in our overarching American identity and talk about these issues, not as proxy soldiers of an international conflict for the Middle East. Jews are on the Israeli camp, we are on the Palestinian side, we are running a proxy war in the United States, which is a desecration of America itself. How we can talk about this international conflict with which we have tremendous amount of disagreements as American citizens not as extension of foreign agent or foreign reality. To that end, <coughs> that would be my concluding remark. I at least try to put as a Muslim, as a recovering anti-Semite, as I see anti-Semitism as primarily a threat to Islam before it becomes a threat to Jewish community. I am selfish, in a holy selfishness. I am worried about the soul of Islam everywhere, especially in America. Because if I learn anything about my religion, hate destroys the barrier first. If in any community, if in any heart, individually or collective, if you let hate to any group, any community, unchallenged for a long time, first it will erode your ethics and morals within. It will become a problem to you. It will be a cancer to you. Don't get me wrong, Muslim anti-Semitism can and is a threat to the Jewish community as well. But it is before that, it's a problem to Islam, the soul of Islam. The ethics of Islam. And I see when the hate goes under un, uncontrolled and, and goes wild in communities, I see the Islam is almost unrecognizable. It's almost unrecognizable. There's a similar threat how the anti Muslim hatred or bigotry could do, and I'm already seeing it in a larger scale in some of the far right communities in Israel, how anti Arab racism, anti Muslim hate has gone so out of control that we Judaism is almost tainted to a point where you cannot even recognize anymore. The similar threat is there. So at least there are two major homeworks or one major homework for each community. For us to bounce back, at least in the United States, where things are not uh, completely out of control. In the Middle East, they have 
as you know, as good as I do. How comes the issues? Uh, my friend here and I were talking about the euro. It, many bridges are burned, many boats have sailed already. In France, in Germany, in, in, in England, the Jewish Muslim relations is experiencing almost a complete disconnect. Many bridges are completely burned beyond repair. But here in the United States, in North America, and therefore that call for reconciliation is a much greater imperative for American Jews and American Muslims. Therefore, it is unforgivable if we don't play our role to exemplify and model what would an at least somewhat reconciled Jewish Muslim relations would look like. My community's moral homework, Muslim community's ethical moral homework mm -hmm. to begin this reconciliation work. My community's understanding of Zionism and Israel, our collective wisdom is completely flawed and fraud and fake. Because of the way we experienced 1948, because of the way the Jewish homecoming project, which I learned to love and understand and even respect later on, what it meant for Jews after 2000 years of being in exile to go back to their homeland, ancestral homeland, I understand that is the story. And in terms of certain it's nothing less than a miracle that it happened. But the way my community experience is, is uh, at least you don't have to agree, you have to see the truth, the world through the app is, is nothing but a catastrophe, nothing but an extension of another crusades, another Western crusade, another Western assault to the honor and the dignity of Islam. And, and displacing Palestinians and shattering the millions of Palestinian lives, et cetera. But this, this led to understanding Zionism as monolithic, one type, one shape, evil reality. So my community's homework is to unlearn what we have learned about Judaism, Zionism, and Israel. And we have to understand, we don't have to agree it's political implications, but at least, to, to think that categorically these realities are nothing but evil, which many unfortunately believe is inaccurate and it's, it's giving rise to incredible amounts of hate within my community. That we have to learn, again, with no obligation to understand or even agree, uh, understand yes, but not agree into the political implications within the East. We have to understand and learn Zionism, Israel, and Judaism within the broad diversity and the spectrum of the Jewish brothers and sisters are learning or experiencing in their own lives. As we Muslims are saying, don't monolithize or racialize Islam. Don't turn Islam into one thing and it's all evil and terrorism. It's wrong. We are 1.7 billion people with so many incredible diversity. We can't do the same injustice to our Jewish brothers and sisters. It's all Judaism, Zionism, and Israel is just one, one evil reality. That's wrong. The little bit of education, little bit of moral decency, moral courage, people should be able to rehabilitate themselves from the hateful um, understanding of these realities. And I try to put my money where my mouth is. The program that I'm running at Shalom Harkin Institute for the last 10 years, it is not a dialogue program. It is not an engagement program. It is a one way of, over the last 10 years, very prominent um, rising, uh, promising North American, Canadian, and American Muslims, they spent 13 months of their uh, fellowship program, two trips to Jerusalem, try to understand the Hartman curriculum, which is in so many ways a marvelous curriculum, because this is exactly what my community is, because it only, not only teaches Zionism of uh, crisis, right, Zionism of refuge, it doesn't only teach Zionism that was born out of Auschwitz, but it also teaches the Zionism of longing, Zionism of belonging, biblical Zionism, the Zionism that was born out of Sinai, in its old spectrum. And it's, it's nothing much short, uh, short than life changing to these Muslim participants to see the world through the Jewish eyes. And my Jewish brothers and sisters, finally, their moral homework uh, as much as possible without losing any pride from your Zionism without losing any joy about this homecoming project of the state of Israel, without losing any sense of loyalty and support and solidarity with Israelis who happen to be Jewish. Can you also open up more space in your heart and mind that this project has caused so much pain? Because Palestinian suffering is not a fiction. It is not a lie. 
It is real. Millions of people are suffering. If you don't believe me, I can take you to places. I can show you the experience that, yes, Israel is not the only region where Palestinians are suffering. Palestinians are suffering under the corrupt, morally corrupt, despicable leadership of their own, both in West Bank and Gaza and other places as well. But there is no denial of the occupation. There is no denial of the since 1948 and ongoing wars, this ongoing Palestinian suffering, which um, caused primarily through the creation of the state of Israel as it, as it continued to thrive and survive. Is there a way in which most people think it's not possible? Most people think if you acknowledge more of the Palestinian suffering, this will be at the expense of your own Zionism. It is not true. Give it a try. Maybe you will be a better Zionist, better Jew, maybe, maybe more proud. You will have more incentives, more courage to save the Zionist project and redeem to its, its sins, its, uh, its failures along the way while they were fulfilling this, uh, this uh, ultimate uh, promise of the Jewish people who in the Holy Land. So there are two incredible resources before us. Our religion, our rich interpretive tradition, our history, and there are, each of us has uh, one primary homework to do. How can we do it here in North Carolina? How can we do it here in the triangle area is our challenge. My voice is not allowing me to <laughs> go any further. Let me pause here and then welcome any every question in response to what I said or even beyond this. I'm sure you meet with imams every day. Uh, <laughs> any question that you might consider asking to a learned imam who spent a significant part of his time learning about Judaism, Jews, Jewish people, and uh, anything that you might uh, consider worthy of asking. The floor is yours. There's no silly question. There's no hateful question. And don't worry, Rabbi Solomon, I will recognize the questions. I'm, I'm quite familiar with the, with the format. Yes, sir. I did have a question because you were brought up in this environment of hate. hate. And you said you became religious. And that's what changed your perspective? Yes. Is that the yes. whole thing that happened? Because that's quite a change. And it's also for a lot of people, it's counterintuitive. Most people think people became hateful because of their religion. And for some people, that is absolutely true. But that's not my experience. Now. That wasn't. Because I was lucky that my initial teachers who taught me religion, they weren't Jewish lovers. But they said, you can't learn law or Sharia or uh, Muslim halakha before you learn ethics and morality. They first taught me ethics and morals and then everything else. Because I established a very strong moral dashboard, I just couldn't reconcile with the level of hate that I had received uh, prior to becoming a, becoming a Muslim. I'll give you one example. In my anti Semitic days, when I see a Jew, visibly Jew, Praying in front of the Western Wall, I would get literally sick, physically sick, when I see this black hair, black hat uh, kind of person uh, worshiping. And as I was learning these religious studies, I, I just saw the English and the Turkish translation of the prayers that people are saying in front of the Western Wall. And now, as a religious Muslim, when I saw how beautifully they are glorifying God's name, those Psalms, that release the knot from my tongue so I can praise your name, God. In the most beautiful language, I cannot tell you how, how religiously ashamed I was that I was looking at an image, feeling disgusted and sick, whereas they were praising the same God, same God that I worshiped in the most beautiful languages. So there were many, many instances. And I saw some of the prayers of Prophet Muhammad as he encountered the Jewish community of his own time. And I saw the religious language around this. So my own religiosity gave me the, what I needed to recover. But what ultimately led me to take the uh, nearest exit and drive in the opposite direction is when I actually met the Jews, when I met the Jewish communities. First Jews I met were uh, high and completely drunk Israeli soldiers. <laughs> <laughs> in India, I was back back in India. And these were people who just completed the idea. Uh, uh, services and they are looking for a cheap hashish in the mountains of uh, <laughs> Afghanistan, the, in India. So it was an incredible experience to see these young men uh, 
who are completely traumatized by the war and, and trying to forget everything that they have witnessed. But still, of course, it's haunting them, the memories of those. Uh, I don't know if you've ever encountered with these, any veterans really going through the war PTSD. And then after coming to the United States, then I saw ethical, moral Jews who were willing to engage with me, hold my hand and teach me Judaism because I was already an avid reader. I, I, my Hebrew is quite okay now. Uh, I would dare say much better than most American Jews. And, <laughs> and then my understanding of the tradition in theory was so wonderful. But when I met wonderful people, Rabbi Ed Solomon, Rabbi Dennis Solomon is among them, and they were able to take that book knowledge into a real human experience that ultimately allowed me to my recovery. But I always say I'm a recovering in Palestine, not recovered. Uh, even though most people would look at me and say, like, hey, well, what is more than recovered? Uh, <clears throat> because when hate goes into your system so early on, um, it requires a lifelong commitment, lifelong, uh, intentional, deliberate lifestyle that you make sure it never comes back because it's always in your system. But yes, you're, yeah, you asked a very simple question. I'll give you a moment to answer. My understanding of Islam, my interpretation of Islam, Islam unfolded within me, helped me to recover. And this is not unique. I do the same thing over and over again. Uh, when a religion, mainstream religion is taught to radicalize people, fundamentalist people, there's a recovering impact of these people. I have seen this over and over in other contexts as well. Yes. Yes, sir. Um, I could probably give a speech now myself, but in trying to boil it down, and I, I see a lot of struggle going on between Sunni and Shiite as well. And it seems like the Sunni world has reached the point of accepting Israel. And the Shiite world is, is still using Israel as an excuse to not accepting anything different from themselves. Um, so I'd like you to comment on all of that. <laughs> because I don't know anything about it, and yet I, I you know, you I, see this I, I, I see getting... that, I, like I have the impression, for example, with Iran, I don't think they're ever going to get a, care about a bomb. They're willing to die for the last Palestinian, they're not willing to die for the last Iranian. Let me, so, let me complicate your question. Were you able to hear? 99% of Palestinians are Sunni. That's, that's the exception. <laughs> well, 99% of Azerbaijani Shias are, uh, Azerbaijanis are Shia. And Azerbaijan is the closest ally of Israel uh, in, in, the, in the Caucasus, in the Central Asian region. Tajikistan, another very close ally of Israel, is Shia. So the geopolitical dynamics that we are laying out and assuming or even implying that um, they are loving or hating Israel because of the sectarian differences. It's not simply not accurate, not true. That's not the case at all. Uh, you are talking about regional powers like Iran, who is the, uh, who is the Shia majority uh, country, wanting a Shi Shia domination in the Middle East, incredible anti Semitic and evil Islamic regime there. And also, most recent, really, it's an incredible miracle. One of the I'm not trying to be political here, but I, as I said, public, I'm not a big fan of President Trump and his administration. And I have been a very vocal and public critic of many of their ethical moral failures. But I think if Trump administration has done one thing without even knowing why, maybe that wasn't even their intention, this upper half at all. It is really incredible. I don't think it was their decision. It, was, it wasn't the intention. I don't believe it's sincere in the peace in the Middle East. But that geopolitical alliance against Shia Iran, that regional uh, uh, coming together and partnering, has given rise to this incredible opening in the, some of the Arab majority and Muslim majority countries, uh, especially in the Gulf, in the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, and Saudi Arabia, and now Morocco, and inshallah, Bazar, Kashem, God willing, the next country will be Sudan. We are working on it. I am involved through my uh, consultancy and advisory role in the State Department to see if the civilian government finally takes over in Sudan, one of the uh, another 22 majority countries, 
how Sudan can join, inshallah, God willing, to Abraham Accord and recognize Israel and South Africa relationship as well. To <clears throat> analyze these very sensitive and complicated geopolitical issues only and exclusively through sectarian difference is just simply not accurate. Not accurate at all. It has very little to do with this. It has very little to, it has a lot to do with the political stuff. I will recognize your question just one second. Let me ask you the first time, or ask Elohim. When did you all hear the word Sunni and Shia for the first time? In 2003, when we were invading Iraq, based on lies, based on deceiving intelligence information that we have given. In 2003, most Americans heard about Sunni and Shia for the first time, for the first time when we were invading Iraq. And I was watching CNN and Donald Rumsfeld, our Secretary of Defense back then. Do you remember that time? He knew exactly where those weapons of mass destruction were. He was just going to go and find them. And run. I don't know. These people should be tried. At least, at least tried as, as a war criminal. One and a half million civilians died in Iraq since then. And almost 20 million Iraqis are now refugees, either internally or externally. Um, and who's losing sleep in the United States? Or in what way this is different than what Russia is doing in Ukraine? Can you morally argue that it is not different? Uh, like you just claim these lives and then go and invade a country and destroy this country and giving lives to ISIS, etc. Anyways, you will understand why Iraq was a big mess from the very beginning. Donald Rumsfeld uh, on CNN saying we are invading Iraq based on the information that we have. We are going to remove Saddam, and the next day, democracy will flourish in Iraq, etc. All these lies. And he's talking about Sunnis, Shias, and Kurds. Sunnis, Shias, and Kurds. That's the first time American landscape has been introduced. I thought he was joking. Like, if you're going to invade a country, would you not read a book about that, please? Like, would you not know <laughs> what these people? Because Iraqis or Middle Eastern themselves, they would never divide themselves as Sunnis, Shias, and Kurds. Sunnis, Shias, and Kurds. This is so idiotic, I cannot tell you. You know what this means? Saying Sunnis and Shias and Kurds is saying like Protestants, Catholics, and Islam. <laughs> <laughs> because Sunni and Shia is a theological and sectarian category. And the Kurds is an ethnic, racial category. And all Kurds, 99.9 of the Kurds are Sunnis. If you think they are killing each other because they are Sunnis and Shias, you would think the Sunni Kurds in the north should be allying with the Sunni Arabs in the middle and should be fighting for the Shia government in the south, right? That's not happening. The Sunni uh, Kurds allying with the Shia government in the south and fighting against the Sunni Arabs in the middle with the help of our government, with the help of American government. So it is, it is beyond uh, sin in my mind to uh, buy into this reductive, shallow, misleading, inaccurate information that these people are killing each other because of their sectarian differences, uh, which is not even scratching the surface when it comes to reality. Historically speaking, is Muslim anti Semitism a recent event? Because uh, reading the history books, you see going back prior to Israel, prior to the Second World War, there was a uh, there was a better relationship between Jews and Muslims. So historically, when we look at, at, at history, this is basically a recent event. Um, <clears throat> uh, yes and no. Uh, to say that Muslim anti-Semitism started in 1948 would be inaccurate, absolutely correct. Uh, Muslim anti-Semitism is as old as Islam itself. So we have those nine verses in the Quran, maybe about a hundred sayings of the Prophet Muhammad out of 9,000. It is as explosive as Jesus on the cross. So Muslims and Muhammad his relationship with the Jewish community is not always very pleasant. There were some Jewish communities that he had to wage war against. And in one particular case, there are 600 Jewish men were uh, killed we did, through the Halahi court decision because they betrayed Muhammad in an existential war, etc. So 
Uh, I want to give you a comparative analysis so you will understand. Muslims have these anti-Semitic elements in their canon, in their texts, and in their developmental years as well. But unlike Christian anti-Semitism, none of these anti-Semitic elements in Islam, in Islamic tradition, moved to the center of the religion. It didn't become the heart and the soul of Islam, unlike Christianity. If you go to Yad Vashem or any Holocaust museum, I am on the board of the US Holocaust Museum, they take you to the historical tour of anti-Semitism. Where do they start the historical tour? Jesus on the cross. And it's a very accurate, very accurate start. That, that story that Jesus being killed on the cross because of the Jews, or by the Jews, according to some interpretations, that story moving to the center of Christianity, that story becoming the center of Christian, Christian soul and heart of it. And over the millennia, every Good Friday, every Sunday morning, imagine the symbol of your religion is scratching these unhealed wounds and pumping anti Semitism over and over again for 2000 years. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying all Christians are anti Semite, all Christian anti Semitism is categorically shared by all Christian communities. But if you cannot connect the dots between Jesus on the cross and the Holocaust, that means you didn't learn anything about anti-Semitism history to begin with. So Muslims, with again, some of it is a sheer luck. We had similar stories that could have moved to the center of Islam. There is nothing anti-Semitic about Crescent and the Star. There is nothing anti-Semitic about fundamental stories we tell ourselves on Friday in the, in the sermons, etc. Muslims were able to keep these anti-Semitic elements in their periphery. And they were able to marginalize in the same example of herpes, they were able to put enough pressure that it only came to the center of Islam. It only came to the center when there's a violence when there's a conflict. That's why the Muslim anti-Semitism is always episodic. It's this century, that Sultan, this particular uh, uh, time period where the Jewish communities experienced with the ruler was different, etc. Look at Maimonides. He was chased out of Spain, but he became the physician and consultant in Egypt, etc. So it's all episodic, it's not across the board. Nothing like regular programs, regular every Sunday morning cursing the Jewish people or calling them as Christ killers, etc. However, what 1948 did is they started moving these peripheral, marginal anti Semitic elements to the center. The Israeli Palestinian conflict, not any, any confrontation. You, as an imam, unfortunately, I'm sure you do as well, Rabbi Solomon, you go through wonderful things like birth and marriage, but you also facilitate divorces. I facilitate one of the most painful ones right now, right after this, I'm going to go back and make sense of these adults. They build an incredible life together for 35 years. Three children, good home, but they are going through a bitter divorce. And all they can remember about that 35 years is the horrible things that they said and did to one another. They are rewriting their history. This is exactly what's going on in the Jewish Muslim intersection, right? We are rewriting our history and our brains, collective memories are tagging only the horrendous memories. And these anti-Semitic elements are moving to the center of Islam. One of the worst examples, one of the most despicable examples, I am on the shot and kill list of Hamas and Hezbollah. So I cannot go to any country where they have any influence. I was able to operate a wonderful Duke University program in Lebanon under the radar for six years. But I can no longer go and continue the program because why? Because I, I try to undermine their Muslim anti-Semitism on the scriptural and the religious ground. And they find this five point five six men incredibly threatening, threatening to a point that they want to kill me. If you look at Hezbollah or Hamas charter, especially the Hamas charter, it is the worst example, but also most authentic example of a Muslim anti-Semitism. If you really read, they use those 11 verses and 100 hadiths and few episodes from Muhammad, but they are trying to create a Muslim Jesus on the cross story with them. If you would have taken this Hamas charter to a Muslim in 1917, in 1925, in 1935, if you put this in front of a Palestinian imam, forget about others. They would laugh. This is not how we do business. This is not how we do religion. This is ridiculous. You cannot do this. But now 
it's it's a, it's a mainstream uh, understanding that somehow there is something religiously cursed. God has condemned the Jewish people in the Bible. It became a cancerous reality. The toxicity of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is, is giving rise and legitimacy and currency and power, religious power, to the already existing anti-Semitism that Muslims for centuries were able to suppress for a very long time. That's because the Jewish Muslim relations were relatively better, not because Muslims were innately inherently more peaceful than the Christians in Europe. Christians didn't have the ability to marginalize these elements because he was very centered in the face of the religion, unfortunately. We were able to for centuries. And inshallah, God willing, we will be able to push them back to the peripheries again. If he can improve the Jewish Muslim relations where we can, especially in the United States. Yes, ma'am. Um, just what you said has really touched my, my heart. And I have, I have a two part question. One is, it's wonderful to hear that you're talking to the State Department. So I've been interested in any of your suggestions for how things that the Biden administration can do to begin to take some small steps for healing. Yes. And then, secondly, <coughs> again, what we as Jews can do as individuals and where we can find opportunities to do that from a much front that you that you are here to talk Thank you very much. We should never give in to hopelessness and despair. We should never, I think Rabbi Nachman says there is no greater sin than the hopelessness. As bad as things get, it always gets better. The history never goes in one direction, all the way up or all the way down. It's never linear. I will come back to your question. One of the most difficult and most hopeless despair moment of my life was um, January 21st, 2016. Trump administration signed the Muslim ban executive. Uh, uh, you know, that is the Holocaust remembrance. That is the Holocaust Remembrance Day. We have a Yom Hashoah in April, but the United States has its own Holocaust Remembrance Day. Why? Because we turn those Jewish refugees back to Auschwitz. We turn those Jewish ships back during the Second World War, and many of them ended up in the Auschwitz. Regretfully, may their memory be a blessing. And we designated a day to remember that we will never do this again. We will not exclude anybody based on their religion. And on that day, this administration did exactly the same. There is no difference between those Syrian refugees and the Jewish refugees sending Mac Assad to be barreled and killed again. So it was one of the most difficult days of my life, really. I didn't want to burn my American passport and just move to Montana and never come. <laughs> or, it was so difficult. Like, how can... How can we as a nation, we did this before, we have failed so miserably. How can we do this again? So four years later, a son of a Holocaust survivor became a Secretary of State. And four years later, someone who has a direct familial relationship, the Holocaust, who became the Secretary of State, the face and voice of America, and American foreign policy and diplomacy, um, so we should never give into despair. As difficult those particular moments where it feels like we are hitting the brick wall and nothing is opening up. Uh, this administration, Assistant Secretary Blinken, is an incredible human being and doing everything he can and his administration can. As you know, in the government, things move very, very slowly. It's painful. I was part of the Secretary John Kerry's uh, Middle East peace plan, one of many failed peace processes. Uh, I took time off from my duke job, full-time work uh, on that particular issue. And I have never seen anybody who is as obsessed as Secretary Kerry. I think that was the last time he thought for years before he went to sleep. And that was the first time, the first thing he thought when he wake up in the morning. He knew Jerusalem map almost like his house. He memorized everything. Like, this guy has, uh, you see the limitations of what could be achieved in the Middle East. Uh, much of what we can do is very limited, up to the Israelis and the Palestinians, whether or not they would like to move the money. And not even Israelis and Palestinians. That's why I had an incredible amount of hope and expectation. This upper Hamra core, things are so stuck now between Israelis and Palestinians. 
uh, regional peace where Saudis, Jordanians, and Egypt and others and Turks, hopefully, unless there is a regional involvement, it's very difficult to undo or unlock. What we can do here is as important, never underestimate. If we can tame the anti Muslim anti Semitism in the United States, even if we cannot export peace process or peace solutions to the Middle East, if we can slow down importing despair, division, polarization, and there's nothing is very very complex. Here locally, uh, this is your second part of the question. I don't know what is this show's relationship with IAR and the Muslim community. There is so much to be done. And um, as I said, again, I'm putting myself into this. Many people, when you talk to these issues, yes, we want to do this. Okay, show me your budget. How much is uh, US dollar commitment you have into Jewish Muslim relations? How much your programming? How much? You see that uh, there's, a, there's a space between genuine desire to do good and an actual commitment to what, what you want to do and achieve. This requires work, this requires investment. This requires saying, we have to make this as one of our top priorities. It will be reflected in our budget and it will be reflected in our calendar. It will be reflected in our commitment, etc. We will do things uh, in partnership with local Muslim communities. We will have refugees. We will build habitat for humanities houses. Opportunities are unlimited. So you're asking me, what can we do? What I'm responding with is, first, let's create the willpower. In Sharia, we have a saying, if there is a will, there is a halakh will. <laughs> the will is not there. The genuine will is not there. You have to create this will first. Thank you for your question. One, one incredible success, I apologize, through the State Department is for the last 11 years, I am trying to shut down the printing houses in Indonesia, in Pakistan, in Mali, and in Niger. They are printing in 94 different languages the protocols of Elder Zion mm -hmm. and uh, Henry Ford International Jew and Monica through Saudi money. Saudis are giving money and these people are printing and publishing. So through Secretary Lincoln, one of our greatest victories now, because now Saudi Arabia is normalizing relationship with Israel, finally, we were able to close the money uh, completely. Uh, so these printing houses, unless they find money through other evil terrorist organization like people like Hamas. I don't think so because it's a significant amount of money, millions of dollars of money. Some of the worst anti-Semitic literature publication houses will be closed because Secretary uh, Lincoln has ordered these particular embassies to work diligently uh, with a group of people that I'm part of that finally are coming to terrible solution. Is okay just one more question? Oh, I just warmed up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but one yes. more when I read letters to my Palestinian neighbors, um, I couldn't help but constantly think about the neighbor and what their response would be. And I was wondering if there's a book that responds or if there's a similar book for the other, um, the other side. I think you should explain what that letters to my Palestinian neighbor is first. Okay. <laughs> um, so there's there's a book out there uh, called Letters to My Palestinian Neighbor, and it's um, a gentleman who was American and moved to uh, Israel. You'll see Klein Halim. Some of you might have heard, famous author, thinker, journalist, who is my uh, who is my uh, sole partner, my holy brother. And that's how I got to learn about you. Yes. So I'm so excited you're here because I have wanted to hear you speak for a long time. Thank you. Um, but he discusses his relationship to Israel and how he wants the, the Palestinians on the other side of the hill that he can almost see and he can hear. He wants them to, to know um, his side. Um, and it's obviously, it's a biased book because it's about his life. Um, and I just, I just kept thinking like, okay, you're in safety and you have a family here. What about the other side? How would they respond? And if you Google the responses, they're not always kind. <laughs> so I wanted to, to know what a good response book would be. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if I just talked to Yossi about hour and a half this morning before I came here, it was a mistake. I shouldn't <laughs> have, because he wasn't feeling well. I just was going to, for a few minutes, say, I hope you are feeling better. It turned into an hour and a half conversation. I lost half of my voice then. I should have saved all my energy here. Yossi Klein Halev, if you haven't read the book, please do. Here's an incredible, incredible book. 
his uh, previous book at the, at, the, at the entrance of the Garden of Eden has really uh, changed my life. That's how we became friends. Uh, as part of his book, for two years, he shot around Palestinian mosques and churches and tried to understand uh, his neighbor's religion, Islam and Christianity. And when I saw his ability to make incredible inroads to my religion, my faith, uh, and the developed appreciation of reverence and respect that he did for Islam. I wrote to him in 2003 saying, you made a journey into my religion and my community and my faith. I want to reciprocate that journey. But my difference is I brought 150 Muslims with me. To journey. <laughs> so he owes me 150 Jews <laughs> in a similar journey. I outdid him. His book, is as attempt now he made this journey to understand the Palestinian narrative, try to see the world through their eyes, and develop some confidence and credibility. He wants to explain himself. He wants to explain what Zionism is, what his homecoming project is. Yes, it's a from it's from a place of privilege, uh, maybe, but it's one of the very rare attempts to explain yourself without apologizing, without defending, without uh, if and ets and buts. Uh, it's a very powerful narrative. If you wanna, if you wanna understand and explain Zionism and Israel to open-minded Muslims, that's a good book. It gives you a lot of helpful language. If you if you buy the paperback edition of his book, you'll see that something remarkable. No author would do this. In the paperback edition of the book, he included 35 Palestinian responses without any comment and response. He added their voices into the paperback edition. Incredible display of moral decency. Really, there is no, I cannot imagine any. He ended the paperback edition of the book with the Palestinian responses without responding himself to this. And he translated the book into Arabic and Arabic downloaded. This book is free, free of charge. You only saw some of the unflattering and unkind responses because they are in English. But if you look at the Persian and Arabic responses, it's incredible. Or go to some uh, on his Facebook account. There are a lot of Muslims in English engaging with him through his ideas, uh, especially the my letters to my Palestine, the book's own uh, Facebook page. It is remarkable. Yes, there is there is this anger and frustration and um, rage, uh, but there is a lot of thoughtfulness and appreciation and responding with a similar level of understanding there as well. Is there a similar book from coming from the Palestinian side of their daily life? Not yet, not, not to my knowledge. I hope from, as we say, from your lips to God's ears. Well, I apologize for my weak voice and broken voice, but it took 15 years to come to that fire. <laughs> I am hoping it will not take another 15 years. That's fine and unfortunately, I encourage every single one of you, don't get lost in the macro ugliness of this issues that we have discussed in your individual life. What you can do to improve Jewish Muslim relations? Have you invited a Muslim to your Shabbat table? Have you ever attended a Muslim iftar or Ramadan service? Do you know Muslims who are living mile radius from your own house, from this community? And then people say, I don't know any Muslims. I never met a Muslim. Really? Have you never been sick at all? If you have been sick in this country, went to a hospital, at least one Muslim touch once. Not inappropriate because all these brown doctors <laughs> and nurses, 99% of the time they are Muslims. They are here, they are your neighbors. And much of the goodness that this community represents, they represent similar values as well. It requires this intentionality. If there is a will, there is a way. I hope the, the one who established the peace in the heavens will establish the peace here among ourselves. And I hope you will play a role in reactivating that moral imagination and manifesting that peace. Thank you very Amazing. much. Thank you so much, Carol Steffi. What an incredible honor. Truly a privilege uh, to be inspired by your words, your stories, not only the wisdom you've shared here today, but a whole lifetime that you've committed and really shown with your life, with your efforts with your energy and inspiring all of us uh, to do the same, each one of us in our own way. 
So I'll just close with a very short story in the spirit of not getting kind of caught up in those, um, these big ideas that we said, and also the despair that can overwhelm us. Uh, you all know in this congregation, our, our oldest child, May Rob, is spent this year on a very special program in Israel, a gap year program called Kibumi. And they spent most of the year in Israel, but now they're doing uh, international travel, exploring how the Jewish diaspora developed and how communities, Jewish communities, uh, built vibrant communities, and also how in many cases they left. Right now, it happens to be the chief in, uh, in, uh, in Istanbul, of all places. Um, but their very first uh, exploration outside of Israel was in Morocco. And Meirav was so excited, she sent me a picture. Of, she knew I would be um, super excited to see an, a very old mikvah uh, mm -hmm. in, a, in a small community in Morocco. Uh, but the story she told about the mikvah was even more inspiring. There is uh, a Moroccan Muslim man who lived very close to the mikvah. He's in his late 80s. And when that particular part of the Moroccan Jewish community fled to Israel, they left the key to the mikvah with this gentleman. And she is now back with her group and he kept the keys for many, many decades. And in this last decade, the, there have been Israeli Jews who have come back to this particular area of Morocco to try to preserve the Jewish culture there and continue to reestablish um, good uh, connections with the, the Moroccan Muslim community. And they met this man who knew all of the prayers from Kabbalat Shabbat because he lived so close to the, the sanctuary, to the Jewish synagogue and to the mikvah. And he still had the keys to the mikvah and he gave them the keys, the keys still work. And it was such a reminder to me, you know, what an example of, am I my brother's keeper? Yes, yes, we are each other's keepers. We are all the same children of one God and God willing, each one of us um, will be inspired to go forward and do our part in holding the keys and protecting one another. So thank you thank so you. much. Nice story. Yes, we're so grateful for you being here today, but for our connection and God willing, we'll continue to build that connection.